our planet inside and out. At least that's what we think. After all, we monitor the Earth and its weather patterns from outer space. We measure the Earth's surface and peer into our deepest depths. In today's world of optimal hardware and intelligent software, mankind is reverting to the status of hunter and gatherers. Researchers from all over the world are compiling a vast and very valuable resource, data about our planet Earth. This data affords a new glimpse of our planet. The ongoing exploration of the world has entered the era of big data. But this development also harbors some big problems. Keeping track of the data, making sense of it, is one of the biggest challenges facing mankind today. No matter where we are at any given moment, they enable us to navigate the world safely. Data about our environment tells us how choppy the sea is and what kind of weather we can expect. Ever since we began creating digital representations of ourselves and our surroundings, we have enjoyed an illusion of safety. After all, the data is precise and can be calculated and analyzed. But still, some phenomena remain unpredictable. These tourists are witnessing a phantom of the seas, a monster wave. Worldwide, on average, two ships per week are lost to these oversized swells. Few people have ever seen one, but what if we could monitor the entire ocean around the clock? An ambitious goal, but not an impossible one. In April 2014, a satellite was launched that ushered in a new era of planetary monitoring. In the coming years, the so-called Sentinel mission will collect data about the oceans, climate, and atmosphere, then transmit the data three times faster than any of its predecessor satellites. The Sentinel mission will beam back 12 billion images to the planet Earth. The geosciences stand to benefit immensely from this unimaginable quantity of data, provided they are able to make sense of it. It's a fantastic voyage to a world we are only beginning to understand. Science is discovering the digital world and creating an entirely new research discipline, scientific data mining. Every day, scientists learn more about the Earth. What's novel is actually this data deluge that is pouring in on us. So we have the sheer volume, we have the velocity, we have the variety and we have aspects of veracity. So actually, we have a big data challenge today to cope with all of that. As the mountain of data grows, so does hope that we can get the oceans under control. For many years, all it took was the trained eye of a seasoned sailor and a lifeboat. In the past 150 years, Coast Guard personnel have saved more than 80,000 lives. But even they sometimes succumb to the waves. During a mission in the North Sea in 1995, the Coast Guard ship Alfred Krupp found itself in the grip of a monster wave that swept two people overboard. Researchers have been gathering data on monster waves ever since this incident. They are collecting information about a phenomenon that was previously virtually unknown. Mathematicians, physicists, and wave researchers are collaborating to figure out what gives rise to these waves. 
They see a correlation between what happened to the Alfred Krupp and a second incident. That same night, the measuring station on an oil platform registered an enormous wave, only 570 kilometers away. Two monster wave incidents on a single night, both within the confines of the relatively small North Sea. This cannot be a coincidence. For the first time, it had been incontrovertibly demonstrated that monster waves exist, but where do they come from? You can't observe the phenomenon of monster waves from the shore. They seem to come suddenly from nowhere in the middle of the sea. The waves themselves are also not visible from outer space. But there are two things our satellites can observe. Optical recordings show cloud formations and radar records reveal wind movements. Researchers compare these two types of recordings and recognize the same structure in each, a ring of clouds. They call this formation an open cell. Open cells are formed when cold air falls to the surface of the North Sea, displacing warmer air to higher altitudes. The cold air becomes a squall that moves over the sea surface. If it's the same speed as the water, it transfers a steady stream of energy to the ocean's wave, causing it to swell. It was the first time that it was possible to see both types of satellite image, radar and optical, at the same time. That led us to the explanation that it was these rings, these cell structures, that had in fact led to such high wind speeds on the surface of the water, which ultimately caused this kind of swell or wave. That also means that monster waves could conceivably form just about anywhere. Is there then no way to protect ships from them? To find out how boats are protected and able to withstand a stormy sea requires more than a few calculations and theoretical examinations of physical materials. There's only one way, by putting ships in the water, although a scale model can also do the trick. In the wave tunnel at Hamburg Shipbuilding Research Institute, engineers are simulating rough seas. They can make waves at the push of a button, then measure the boat's reactions. Is the ship built well enough to stand up against high waves, or should its design be modified? When ships are pushed to their limits, a number of factors determine whether they will survive. If the captain's bridge is located up front at the bow, the wave hits the most sensitive part of the ship. Future shipbuilders can take that into consideration. But when can monster waves be expected? That's what the researchers want to find out. On the Fino research platform, measuring equipment records comprehensive data about a giant wave. It's a fortunate coincidence, as it enables the researchers to map the phenomenon on a computer. If the water is being whipped up by the squalls of an open cell, the scientists have to include the wind in their calculations. Susanna Lehner and her team have augmented a conventional wave model with data about the wind speed of squalls. And sure enough, the simulation corresponds exactly to the wave recorded by the measuring equipment. Theoretically, computers should be capable of predicting monster waves. But in the real world, this is not yet possible. It would require constant satellite surveillance, and that kind of bandwidth simply doesn't exist. So we still have to be on the lookout for monster waves. But computer scientist Peter Baumann is certain that, in the future, scientists will be able to obtain and analyze additional data and create strategies to ensure safer seas. He has been commissioned by the European Union to find ways to deal with large amounts of data. So the next step would be based on more satellite data that we have on ocean observations, on more simulations, to actually do forecasts, to do predictions, so that ships can be warned ahead of such freak waves and can react accordingly. In order to achieve that, 
we need an even better observation of the oceans. Traditionally, satellite imagery has focused on land. That was interesting in the first place. Now we also need to watch the oceans very closely. And it's also about large scale simulations. So on ocean scale, like Northern Atlantic simulation, in order to obtain that. That means even more data and even more complex analysis have to be run in order to allow such forecasts. But the more data we collect, the more difficult processing it becomes. Computers are capable of storing large amounts of data, but there are limits to the amount of data that can be transported. Today, if you want to move 10 terabytes of data, the Internet won't do you much good. That much data practically has to be moved like you would a crate of bananas. Except the truck will be filled with hard drives instead of fruit. One of the central hubs for processing scientific data can be found right in the middle of Lisbon. The European Maritime Safety Agency, or EMSA, needs comprehensive data as soon as possible. The data comes from all over Europe supplied by a huge network of researchers. This is the central node in an ambitious project called the Clean Sea Net that monitors European waters in near real time. The experts evaluate randomly selected satellite images of the seas, looking for conspicuous spots on the surface of the water. The office also handles several emergencies each year, a captain, a coast guard, or a concerned citizen calls to report a suspicious discovery on the high seas. Could it be that a ship has illegally discharged oil into the water? Objects on the water are not static. They're all moving, always. Ships especially, but also oil slicks. And it's important for our member countries to be able to react quickly, for example, by recognizing potential polluters and apprehending them. The collaborators in Clean Sea Net first have to determine which satellite is near the location in question. In this case, a ship has been sighted off the coast of England. Is there a satellite that can deliver images of the area within the next 15 minutes? The experts are lucky. A picture is available. It usually takes several days, but right now, the data is needed faster. So the satellite sends the data directly to the nearest station, where the image is processed and forwarded to Lisbon in short order. Olaf Trishman and his team compare the satellite image with the maritime traffic reports. Every ship transmits a signal at regular intervals that can be used to identify the ship and its route. The oil slick off the coast of England can be connected to a specific ship. The polluter's identity is revealed. I compare clean CNET to speed checks on highways. Drivers know their speed may be measured using radar, and it's the same way with Clean CNET. Ships know that there's an agency that might be checking to see whether they have illegally discharged oil, so they're more careful. It leads to more safety and better behavior. The deterrent actually seems to be working. The pollution rate on the seas has decreased considerably since Clean Sea Net was set up. Good evening, Emsa speaking. Yes, we have identified an oil spill in your uh, southwest. 30 minutes after the picture was taken, Trishman informs the authorities. You can't get much faster than that. Computers can process large amounts of data, but can't replace the experienced eyes of the experts. Evaluating large amounts of data naturally also requires a massive amount of data processing. First, the raw data from the satellite has to be turned into images. But of course, there is also lots of analysis to be done. And that analysis is carried out by people at the moment, not by machines. We have observed that the algorithms currently available are not sufficient to ensure reliable identification of polluters. 
We humans are at a disadvantage because we are not capable of working round the clock. And the faster the data comes in, the more difficult it becomes for us to process it. Even our computers are not equipped for the rate of speed at which the data is delivered. The result is a huge backlog of data, a mountain of information that is quite literally over the heads of today's scientists. This big data, this data deluge that is coming in on us, actually poses, us, poses new problems on us. So we have the data, but how can we analyze that? It is not just the sheer volume, it's also about the speed, how data come in. Now imagine you have a fire hose and you try to drink from that. Then you get a picture of what is our situation there. We cannot analyze data at the volume and speed they're coming in on us. So are we really only getting a small sip instead of a deluge? Is information being lost because data is being collected that can never be analyzed? The German satellite data archive near Munich contains vast amounts of valuable data collected over the past 30 years. The archive can store more than 50 petabytes of data on magnetic cassette tapes. It may be that these tapes hold the answers to questions that won't be posed until sometime in the future. But when that day comes, will we be able to access the data? The more data we save for later, the greater the risk of losing information forever. Even the best storage media can age and become obsolete. But maybe there's a way to master the deluge of archived images and virtual reality. Researchers are mining the satellite data archive, hoping to make its information more readily accessible. As if the archive were a library with open books lying before them, the scientists can pick out an image, dive into it as it were, and check to see whether it shows structures similar to those on other images. The computer works like an automatic sorting facility. It searches the images for components like vegetation, farmland, bridges, and water. The computer sorts the images into stacks and categorizes them by their content. At the present, they probably store in archives more than 10 to 20 million of satellite images acquired after the 80s year. Uh, with a new era of the Sentinel satellites of the European Space Agency, the data volume per day will reach uh, the level of 10 uh, terabytes. This is our data rate. So we are going to reach soon thousands of petabytes of data, which is a large volume of data. And all the research community is putting huge efforts in uh, dealing with information extraction. Soon, we will no longer be talking about millions or billions of images, but trillions. And then it will be more important than ever to uncover meaningful information hidden in the mountains of data. And satellites are not the only instruments that deliver data about our planet. In fact, researchers the world over are currently measuring and recording data in an effort to learn more about the Earth. The data they are collecting is recorded in many diverse formats and resolutions. Researchers plumbing the depths of the ocean use different standards and measurements than scientists studying the atmosphere, for example. But what if they could augment each other's findings with their own? and discover details that are new to both disciplines. If they can find a way to combine data from diverse sources, we will have a more precise comprehension of the planet Earth. But it's no easy task. The more diverse the data sources, the more difficult it is for the computer to standardize the data. The different formats have to be compared with one another constantly. Unless it is done properly, the scientists receive a distorted view. But the promise of big data is precise results, and Peter Baumann has found a way to achieve that. He is looking for the needle in the huge haystack of data, and his Earth server technology helps him find it. 
It ensures that the database knows exactly which data a researcher needs and which to ignore. Basically, it works like a bookshelf. Data is generally stored in small packets, lined up on a shelf in an orderly fashion, so they're easy to find. When a researcher sends a request to the server, he doesn't have to browse through all the data on the shelf, but can go straight to the packet that's relevant to him. Actually, the scientist doesn't even notice how big the data mountain is, but receives a tailor-made result back from the server. In the Earth Server project, we are establishing big Earth data analytics, that is, rapid ad hoc processing and filtering on massive geodata. To this end, we use a database approach. This may sound technical, but actually a database you're using all the time. You go to eBay and search, you talk to a database. You are going to Amazon and searching something, there is a database behind. Now databases have been tremendously successful, but actually they do not support the technical scientific data. And this is the gap we are closing, to offer these flexible, scalable database services on the multidimensional data that make up for the big geodata. Faster access to data for everyone, from anywhere in the world. That also means making the data available to any individual who wants to access it. But just how much does this view of the world tell us about ourselves? Our globalized society is changing rapidly. It won't be long before the Earth is bursting at its seams. And the faster our megacities grow, the more difficult it is for us to keep up with all the changes. Can data about the planet help us get a handle on things? Is it possible to data map people's behavior? And should we even want to? In our collective consciousness, data collection has achieved an unfavorable reputation. People are deeply concerned about privacy issues. Will we still have any privacy when everything that happens on the planet is measured, recorded, and stored? Geodata can also include information about people, but this is not necessarily a bad thing. At the German Aerospace Center near Munich, Hannes Taubenberg is examining how the face of the world is changing. As a geographer, he evaluates satellite images to investigate how cities are changing, particular in Asia. But can data collected by observing the planet from space help us comprehend where society is going? These data give me first my First of all, this data gives us information about the planet's surface. And we are concerned with extracting information from the data. So if I look at a satellite image, what I get is not information, but merely a visual impression. We are working to create formulas that can be used to extract quantitative information from the data. Taubenberg has taught his computer to distinguish inhabited areas from uninhabited ones. The closer people live together, the more difficult it is to assess how many people actually live at a given location. But a bird's eye view includes one good indicator, namely roofs. Once the computer has recognized an element as a building's roof, it begins looking for similar structures. The computer counts how many roofs are visible. Now Taubenberg is using this formula to comprehend the growth of the city of Hong Kong. Back in 1975, Hong Kong was already a metropolis with a population of 4 million. The city has experienced enormous population growth since then, and it is expanding onto the mainland and becoming consolidated with other urban areas. The most amazing finding is that megacities, urban regions with more than 10 million inhabitants, can no longer be seen as the largest urban conglomerates on the planet. Now we speak of mega-regions, which are conglomerations of cities growing together, whose populations are no longer 10 or 20 million, but 100 million inhabitants. A city with a population of 100 million that's more inhabitants than the countries of France, Belgium, and the Netherlands combined. 
Data collection can also facilitate humanitarian assistance. Since the crisis in Syria began, the al satari refugee camp in Jordan has been growing bigger by the day. On the ground, it's virtually impossible to determine how many people live there and how fast the population is growing. But Elisabeth Schöpfer can take a close look at developments from her desk in Germany. She's trying to find out how many refugees have come to the camp using satellite images that reveal the shape of the camp. By distinguishing between the various types of camp structures, we can better estimate and determine the number of inhabitants in the refugee camp. We assume that the numbers of people living in tents differs from that of those in large containers. And the more precisely we can distinguish between the categories, the better our overall population estimate will be. All that can be seen with the unaided eye are spots. But Schoeffer can program the computer to recognize and distinguish between tents and containers and count them. The computer then scans the image for similar structures. Piece by piece, she is slowly able to decode the structure of the camp. Schoeffer repeats this analysis every few months. Her images reveal orderly rows of huts that were distributed by aid organizations, as well as the wild settlements with smaller habitations. Within a year, the camp became the fourth largest city in Jordan. This enormous population growth could lead to major conflicts. Because of the tremendous population growth, that is, the flood of refugees streaming into the region, there can be shortages, for example, of water and wood, and this can lead to conflicts. So we use a time series analysis to evaluate archived images to determine whether shortages really are occurring, and if so, how we can respond to them. Elisabeth Schöpfer is in close contact with on-site NGOs who act quickly to implement the recommendations she makes from her office in Germany. Eyes in the sky are facilitating an overview of the urgency on the ground. In Europe, it's those who live on riverbanks that could use this kind of analysis. Anyone who lives close to the water's edge is familiar with the deceptive quiet and how quickly catastrophe can strike. Extreme weather conditions are increasing in frequency, scientists say as a result of climate change. When rain soaks the countryside and the ground can no longer absorb the water, rivers begin rising into the surrounding landscape. An act of nature beyond control. Or can we calculate when the next high water mark will arrive? If a given region only flooded once in the past hundred years, the statistics look good, but nature is unpredictable. Once a flood has occurred, it's at least possible to determine the level of damage. At the Center for Satellite Supported Crisis Information, Hendrik Svensner collects the data and uses them to evaluate the situation. The real strength of long-distance surveillance is that it provides an overview, an actual view of the catastrophe, the scope of flooding, all visible on a single image. So it's primarily used in situation centers to help distribute resources, to know what's happening and where aid can best be deployed. The satellite bounces signals off the Earth's surface and assesses what is reflected back. Because water reflects the signals differently than land, experts can recognize which regions are flooded and convert the information into maps. The maps represent the current situation, which areas are flooded and where help is needed. Satellite surveillance is a blessing for the people affected, but the data can't prevent the catastrophe from occurring.
there is equipment that can determine which areas might be threatened by flooding in the future. A laser scanner. It measures the Earth's surface much more precisely than a satellite. When it flies over a potential floodplain, the device transmits signals and uses their reflections to determine the distance to all the objects they encounter on the ground. The result is a high-resolution digital model of the terrain and its structures. Koblenz, at the confluence of the Rhine and Moselle rivers, has experienced plenty of floods. At what level do the waters become threatening? After the flight, the surveying engineers turn the raw data into a model of the terrain. Then they can simulate various water levels and examine how floodwaters would rise. When two flooded rivers meet, the situation is particularly dangerous. The three-dimensional model relies on millions of measuring points. Precise simulations like this are used to help plan dikes and make residences flood-proof. But it's not just local residents who are interested in the data. Insurance companies allocate each residence located near the water to a particular risk category. The so-called Deutsches Eck in Koblenz exhibits all four risk levels. The homes in zones one and two are at low risk, but three and four are considered high risk. Only one-fourth of the homes in zone four are insured. If the insurance companies assess the risk as too high, the residents have no choice. They are aware of the danger, but there's not much they can do about it. The more precise the data we collect, the more we are influenced by the results. But we still have to interpret the data on our own. And that's where the trouble starts. Because it presumes the scientists know exactly which data sets they need. That's a prerequisite for reliable results. The data being processed must be the appropriate data. If a researcher selects the wrong sets of data, he's working with information that doesn't answer the question. The result looks right, but it's actually erroneous. Whether the data can be properly interpreted can sometimes be a matter of life and death. Since the earthquake in the Abruzzo region of Italy in April 2009, L'Aquila has been a ghost town. Seismologists had investigated the site just prior to the disaster and delivered their data to the authorities, but the mayor gave no evacuation order. They didn't see it coming an earthquake that claimed more than 300 lives and ripped holes in rows of houses. 70,000 people lost their homes. The seismologists were held responsible. Judges sentenced them to six years in jail for negligent homicide. Researchers can, of course, supply the data. Responsibility for the decisions made still, however, remains with the authorities and politicians. This incident in L'Aquila actually shows very clear how these challenges and these technological advances affect society. There is an interplay. So on the one hand, um, what is the meaning of, let us say, with a, uh, with a probability of 60%, we will have an earthquake. How should a mayor react on that? So that is something where we have to learn how to deal with that information that we get that we didn't have before. Everybody interprets the data according to his or her own preconceptions. And that becomes especially problematic when data-supported research is conducted on a global scale. A German-American research project has set itself an ambitious goal. Scientists are measuring the entire gravitational field of planet Earth. 
Earth's field of gravity is not the same everywhere. A mission called GRACE is investigating how the mass is distributed. GRACE employs two satellites orbiting the Earth. They constantly measure their distance from one another. When the first satellite approaches a mountain, it is briefly attracted to it. The distance between the two satellites varies. The researchers use this data to calculate the Earth's field of gravity. The resulting information is of global interest. It reveals the distribution of water on our planet. Greece has been collecting data for more than 10 years. The data is updated monthly and compared with the previous data. This makes it possible to conduct precise calculations. Once you've determined Earth's field of gravity, you know how mass changes within the planetary system. Or you can observe how polar ice is changing, for example, that it is melting into the oceans. You can observe hydrological circulation on land. Built into GRACE is the capability to see how much surface water there is, how much precipitation, drainage, and also how much the groundwater level has changed within a given period of time. A satellite can only transmit data to Earth when it passes a station on the ground. The flyover lasts 15 minutes. The ground stations have to know exactly when the satellite is passing overhead. Contact is only possible for these 15 minutes. Then Grace speeds away again to measure another piece of the Earth. For example, in America. The American Great Plains are one of the world's most productive agricultural areas. It's called America's breadbasket because its generous harvests of wheat, corn and soybeans feed people and animals the world over. But actually, the farmers should slow down a bit. Their agricultural success is based on a single factor, a huge water reservoir called the Ogallala Aquifer. This ancient reservoir, collected at the end of the last ice age, stretches from South Dakota to Texas. Especially in the Midwest of the USA, in Garden City, Kansas, this water reservoir is the elixir of life for local farmers. They are pulling it from the earth with all their might. Week after week, month after month, year after year, their irrigation systems extract water from the Ogallala Aquifer. The irrigators rotate around their own axis, watering the crops. It takes the equipment eight days to trace one circle. The farmers are especially dependent on water from the aquifer now that rain is becoming increasingly scarce in Kansas. Once before, back in the 1930s, the region was hit by an extreme drought. Everyone waited in vain for rain. Because the electricity network didn't yet extend to rural areas, the farmers were unable to pump water from the Ogallala and were forced to watch their farmland dry out. Dust storms turned the landscape into a desert. Many people had no alternative but to abandon their homes to the approaching sands. And today? In some places, Kansas looks just like it did then. Rain is more and more rare. Without irrigation, the land dries out. But the underground reservoir offers no solution. The GRACE findings are alarming. Since they first began measuring the Ogallala Aquifer in 2002, it has shrunk considerably. People are wringing it out like a sponge, down to the last drop. The authorities have taken initial steps. Kansas appoints groundwater district managers. 
They serve as administrators of the groundwater and encourage farmers to conserve the valuable resource. The authorities perform regular checks of the amount of water farmers remove from the groundwater. Most farmers have their own wells on their fields that extract water directly from the Ogallala. They are required to install meters on their wells that measure how much water they pump. Coming up on 036196, serial number 95. Typically, if it's an overpump, there's a fine and then a um, whatever the water, the amount of the overpump, uh, two times that is is held back the next year. And so the, uh, you know, the first time is normally a warning and, and, uh, and then after that, if you've had your warning, then there may be a fine and a loss of water the following year uh, equal to the amount or in some cases twice the amount. And then, and then uh, that's the penalty and, and usually a one-time deal and then it's back to the normal quantity the, after that. Things are not easy for the local residents. Nathan Kell's family has lived here for more than a hundred years. He comes from a long line of farmers. He doesn't want to leave, but his problems are multiplying. Within the last, you know, 10 years, you know, we've lost, you know, 80, 90 percent of our water volume that we had uh, just 15 years ago. So it became a real eye opener probably within the last maybe even five years, how bad the situation is really getting. And of course, there's different areas that are worse than others. And unfortunately, our farm here in Haskell County, Kansas, is uh, one of the worst areas as far as the, how quickly it's depleting. Nathan pulled the emergency cord. He no longer plants corn or soybeans. He raises cattle. Given the limitations set out by groundwater management, he can hardly operate efficiently. Cattle need water too, but they don't have to be irrigated day and night. No one knows how long the water will last. It depends on how much water the farmers are willing to save. They feed their cattle corn and sorghum, crops they grow on their own land, and that takes a lot of water, too. But above all, it's the big agribusinesses that find it difficult to conserve water. They still make most of their money with corn, the thirstiest crop of them all. The big money is not in feed corn, but in the booming ethanol industry. Business is especially good for Bonanza Ethanol Refinery in Garden City. They are happy to buy the region's corn. Maybe the final reserves from the Ogallala Aquifer will end up in the bioethanol they produce. The measurements supplied by Grace are no secret, but they haven't exactly led to a change of attitude. After all, at the moment, there's still enough water and there's still a lot of money to be made before the wells dry up. Grace has discovered that the groundwater level is sinking not only in the USA, but worldwide. In many countries, the cause is agricultural irrigation. Satellite surveillance data can only deliver a warning. We still have to decide how to respond. Now there is this example of the GRACE satellite that measures how there are fluctuations in groundwater. That means avail availability of drinking water. If somebody gets this information and somebody else doesn't, they can take advantage both economically, making money, but that also could mean that there is a restriction later on. People who would need it cannot get any longer access to fresh water, which is obviously not what we want. So politics, but also together with economists, philosophers, technology people, 
need to come together and establish new ethics, new norms and, in the end, new laws. But who will decide who gets to make money off the data? Who does the information about disputed territories, like the Arctic Ocean, belong to? The Arctic Ocean and its year-round ice cap have seen a lot of visitors lately, but not only from climate scientists. The warmer Earth becomes, the more ice melts, and the easier it is to venture into the Arctic Ocean. The polar region has become passable by ships for several months of the summer. This information is worth a fortune. International commercial shipping lines save a lot of money by taking a shortcut through the Arctic Sea. The quicker they can deliver their merchandise, the more they can ship. Previously, that was only possible with the help of icebreakers. But the data about the changing ice cap have attracted container ships. It's big business. The Northeast Passage through the Arctic Sea connects Europe and Asia. From Hamburg to Tokyo, it's one quarter shorter than the previous southern route through the Suez Canal. A ship owner can save up to $300,000 per ship by sending it through the pack ice. This has an impact on the region's unique fauna. Scientists estimate that after 2030, container ships will be able to traverse the Arctic Ocean without hindrance. And depending on their loads, commercial ships passing through the Arctic Ocean could have catastrophic effects on the sensitive ecosystem of the Arctic Ocean. If a ship were to sink here or lose oil, it would take decades for the environment to recover and experience is not always a good teacher. The SOS that reached Alaska's Coast Guard on March 24, 1989, signaled one of the biggest ecological disasters in the history of the world. The Exxon Valdez bled nearly 40 million liters of raw oil into the Arctic water. The animals that die in the oil slick were but the first victims of the Valdez. To this day, the oil can still be found in Alaska's waters. Because of the cold climate, it decomposes very slowly. If the Arctic Sea becomes a major global shipping route, the region will need special protection. With the help of satellites, researchers can make a snapshot of the momentary dimensions of the ice cap. But conditions can change quickly. A shipping channel that is free of ice today can be impassable tomorrow. That's why scientists from a variety of disciplines are collaborating on a unique project. At the German Climate Research Center, a supercomputer collates satellite data and information about the Arctic Ocean. We must above all determine how the ice is moving. To do that, we need both meteorological and oceanic data. And calculating both, we are capable of predicting the future conditions of the ice. The team of meteorologists, shipbuilding engineers and marine physicists is creating a map showing the best pathways through the ice for the next six days. Which channel is safest? Would a detour be worthwhile? The scientists provide navigational aids for the shrinking polar ice. Equipped with this kind of navigational system, a research ship called Lance set out into the Arctic Ocean in March of 2014. It was an initial practical test. How much ice a ship can withstand depends on how it is constructed. That's why the navigational system includes the ship's construction data in its calculations. Each ship has its own recommended route. Safety also plays a major role in selecting the best route. For example, certain ships may not be sufficiently strong in terms of their construction to stand up to the ice. 
In addition, some ships may not have enough engine power to maneuver on their own in the icy waters. And both of these things are dangerous and can lead to accidents. Thanks to the navigational system, Lance made it safely through the ice. The easier it is for ships to navigate the Arctic Ocean, the less damage they will do to this unique polar region. And as a side benefit, the shipping lines make plenty of profit. In the future, it will probably be hard to say who benefits most from geodata. But one thing is certain. The more powerful our computers become, the more we are learning about the Earth. For example, if we feed a computer with data about temperature, Earth rotation, and the condition of the soil, we get a new image of the ocean. Swirls trap warm and salty water. The fact that these pockets of saltiness traverse the seas, or how the ocean's temperature is changing, these are all things only a computer can reveal. No scientist could make these observations on site, so learning to process large amounts of data is worthwhile. It's estimated that scientists spend 80% of their time managing data and only 20% evaluating it. It's important for this ratio to be reversed in the future. For dealing with the trustworthiness aspects and how to assess and evaluate such big data, we see a new kind of profession emerging. It's a data scientist or data engineer. People who have a strong background in the computer disciplines involved, like databases, supercomputing, etc., but also in statistics so that they can assess how good such data are for a particular purpose. And finally, of course, the domain knowledge to know about biology, to know about geodata, etc. Our ever-accelerating journey into the digital universe is only just beginning. The more data we collect, the more secrets we reveal about our planet. We will learn to better understand natural disasters and to protect ourselves against them if we gain control of the data. There's still much to learn about our planet Earth, and it's just a mouse click away. <laughs>